morning, everyone. Welcome to our first family service at Arbor. And you know, this is our family service where, like Jake said, we have no child care at all this morning, so we have all the kids in the room. And you would think that would be the most distracting thing for me, but no, it is seeing all these Seahawks colors <laughs> in this crowd. Go Niners! That's all I'm saying. Well, welcome to Arbor. Welcome to our family service. It's a service that we are excited to have because we have the whole family in here as we are celebrating just family in general and our church family as one. And we are doing this because we think that we have a message for the whole family. So whether you're 18 years or older to order or begging those who are to order, we have a message for you. And it starts with a verse that I know parents are going to love. Parents are going to memorize. You're probably going to bring it up to your kid every single day for the rest of their life. And a verse that I think kids are going to try to ignore and roll their eyes every time they hear it. It is in Ephesians 6, 1 through 4. So it's on the screen. If you guys want to follow along with me, it says, Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Amen. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise. If you honor your father... And mother, things will go well for you. And things will go well for you, and you will live a long life on earth. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So children in the room, I am very sorry to bring this up. But the Bible says that you should obey your parents because you belong to the Lord it is the right thing to do, and also why? Because of the horrible, horrible dadism that I heard growing up, which is, I brought you into this world, take you out. Kids, if your parents have said that to you, raise your hand. I want to see. We're going we're gonna to let Michael know who our prospect leaders are in our children's ministry. We need some biblical discipline in our rooms. But is a dadism I heard, and kids, I am so sorry, it is very biblical. You see, this verse, uh, I, kids, sorry, but don't worry, your parents are also included because your parents, it says for your fathers, and some translations say parents here, fathers, do not provoke your children to the point of anger. Instead, raise them up with discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So, so far, this has been a great sermon. Parents are looking at their kids, kids are looking at their parents, and you're just staring at each other like, who wins this argument here? And so far, it's been very divisive. But don't worry, I'm going to bring the Lord, our Jesus Christ, into this sermon. Because you see, as funny, as funny as this verse is, this has to be one of the most difficult practices that we have as a family. See, as a kid, you're thinking, obey my parents? Brian, are you serious? Obey my parents. You don't, you don't know my parents. My parents, they don't get me. They don't understand me. You see, I try and explain to them, but it, it's like it goes over their head. They just, they don't understand. I know all kids say that their parents don't get them, but I promise you, Brian, my parents don't get me. And the parents are saying, oh, I get them. I get them. I just know what's best for them. And so then you have this constant battle of this kid trying to explain, like, like oh, but, but listen, listen, you don't understand. And the parent's like, no, I do understand. You understand. And it's back and forth, like, no, listen to me. No, you listen to me. Uh, but, but mom, dad, I will not tell you again for the third time, no. And you get into this, this cycle of just arguing and arguing and arguing. And the kids are just like, but you just don't understand. And kids, you feel right. Am I right? You feel like in these situations you were right. Parents, you feel like you just know what's best and you, you get it. You just, you get it more. Am I right? That is a struggle with families. And I believe that this is a struggle that God knew was going to happen, which is why he gave us this Ephesians 6 verse. But not only did he know it was going to happen, I think this is a struggle that Jesus experienced himself. So I want to share a story with you guys. The story is in Luke chapter 2. You can follow along in your Bibles, but I am just going to share this story. A story of Jesus' family. Jesus with his parents, Mary and Joseph. So this story starts off with, with a normal family. 
going to a festival called Passover. Now, this festival, it was the big festival. Like, this is the one that everybody would go to. If you, if you didn't live in Jerusalem, you were traveling to Jerusalem. And you would take days and days to make this journey because this was a thing that you wanted to do. This was a thing that the whole family would go to. So you would walk and you would go, you would bring your family, you would bring relatives, distant relatives, acquaintances, and you were just going, making this wonderful journey to Jerusalem and just having fun. It's a normal event for a family in this time. But this event was a little bit different for, for Jesus and his family. Because Jesus is now 12 years old. And what that means is Jesus can now participate in the Passover festival. You see, if you weren't 12, you weren't able to do everything. And Jesus, you know, probably as a kid would want to do this so bad. Like, I, I just want to do it. I want to participate. Mom and dad, please let me do it. And parents would say, I'm sorry, you're not old enough. Maybe when you're older, like, you just, you just have to wait. You're not old enough. And kids are like, this is not fair. I want to do this. Everybody else gets to do this. And it's just like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, you're just, you're just not old enough. And so you kids, raise your hand if you have older siblings, the kids in the room. You have older siblings. Do you feel like the older siblings get to break all the rules that are on you? Do you feel that? Yeah, you feel that way? Yep. It's like you have an older sibling. It's like, wait, 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 wait. They don't. They don't have a bad time. Or why do they get to stay with their friends? This is not fair. And the parents will look at you and say, when you're older. So right now, Jesus is older. And he gets to do everything everything the adults get to do. He gets to, to, to sing praises, worship his father. He gets to eat a meal with everybody and still worship his father, gets to hear teachings and, and gets to speak and people now get to listen to him somewhat. He is now an adult and he gets to participate in the Passover. And guys, I have to believe that, that Jesus was excited and that Jesus just felt like he was completely home. Like this was the, probably the best day of his life up to that point. Like he finally got to do the Passover meal to just praise and worship his father. But now the meal was done, the festival is ending, and it's time to go home. Everything is dying down. It's time to go home. And now the family, Mary and Joseph, they're, they're packing up, getting everything ready, and they start making the journey. And again, guys, like I said, it, it, there's a thousand, thousands of people, acquaintances, relatives, they're making this journey back home. And Mary and Joseph, they, it took them a couple days to make this journey. So they're, they're packing up, they're getting ready, and they're walking now with a huge crowd, just talking about everything that's going on and how amazing this event was. And, and, and Jesus, oh my gosh, Jesus, he probably had the greatest time. Did you see Jesus' face? Like he, he could not get that smile off his face. He was having the best time. Man, I feel like we're missing something, though. You guys know that feeling uh, when you've packed and you like after you've done packing, and maybe you guys have done this on your last Christmas trip here, and you're just you pack, you put everything together, and you're just you're staring at your bag, and like, man, I feel like I'm missing something. Socks? No, no, I got socks. My shoes? I'm wearing those. I don't need another pair. Maybe if I'm running, but let's be honest, I'm not running. Underwear, I don't wear those. <laughs> but, but they're wondering, they're like, they're having that feeling like something is completely missing. And they're thinking and they're thinking and, and then they have the Kevin moment. <laughs> if you kids don't know what the Kevin moment is, your parents are failing you. <laughs> but they're having the home alone feeling, they've realized that Jesus is completely missing. So now they're going around asking all their friends and relatives, again, thousands of people walking by, like, where's Jesus? Have you seen Jesus? And they're getting a little frantic and a little scared, and they cannot find Jesus. And this is the Son of God. They have lost the Son of God. And they're trying to find him, like, where, where is Jesus? And i got to be honest with you guys, I am a parent, but I have a nine-month-year-old son. I don't have that feeling of missing a child, thank the Lord, I would be starting this, this whole parent thing off really bad. But I may not have that feeling, but I was the child who got left behind. When I was growing up, my family, my, my siblings, we got invited to go to Chuck E. Cheese. Now, Chuck E. Cheese, 
as a kid, that is the greatest place on earth. It's the cheapest games. You get to go on the play structure. It's disgusting, greasy pizza, but it's what you want as a kid. But see, me and my brothers, we had a different plan when we go to Chuck E. Cheese. It's always been our diabolical plan. And this trip, this birthday party of our cousin, we are going to do it. We are going to fill up our water guns, and we are going to shoot that mechanical mouse. That is our plan. We want to shoot the mouse. So we're getting ready. We're super excited. we got the whole plan laid out. Plans out. This is where we're going to shoot. This is where we're going to run. And we're going to run underneath that little mini door that was at our Chuck E. Cheese. Like they, they had a little kid door that you got to like go under. And we were going to slide out and we were going to make a break for it as we shot the mouse. So our brothers were all like laughing, doing that little <laughs> as we're filling up our, our water gun. And then finally we get it up. We're like ready. We put it in our backpacks. And as we're heading out, we go to our, our car and we notice that the van is gone. And we're just waiting there, just waiting there, like, where's mom? So we go back to the house, and we're just looking, mom, mom. And we just sit on the couch and wait. And guys, it felt like an eternity that we're waiting. And then our phone starts ringing probably hours later. And we answer the phone, and it's my mom like, we're like, hello? It's like, are you guys home? It's like, Yes. <laughs> yes, we are, Mom. She goes, I'm so sorry, gives all the apologies, but there is nothing you can make up for missing the opportunity to shoot the mechanical mouse. Because by the time that she picked us up and we got to Chuck E. Cheese, the whole show was done. All we got to do was play the games and eat food, but we were disappointed, and never again did we get our chance to shoot that mouse. So I don't know what it's like losing a child. But I definitely know what it's like missing a child. And right now, right now, Mo, uh, Mary and Joseph have that feeling of losing a child, and now they have a decision to make. They're wondering, okay, where is he? Where, where, where is he? We need, we need to find him. He's missing, and they have one question that they need to ask themselves. After checking with their family acquaintances, they're stuck with this one big question. Where can Jesus be? So right now, I want to take a break because I'm the youth director here, and we like to play games at Arbor students, so I want to play a game right now with the families here at Arbor, and I need some volunteers. I need some volunteers on stage, so if you're brave enough to be on video for the whole world to see, I need some volunteers. I need a parent and their child. So raise your hand if you want to come up on stage. I'll take you. You can choose one of your, one of your, one of your children here. I'll take a, is there an elementary kid? Kid in the orchard. I want a kid from the orchard. Somebody over here? You can come up here. You can bring one of your parents. And right now, I need a high schooler. I want a high schooler. Is Michael here? Is Michael, Michael, get up here. Michael, choose a parent. You didn't know you're making, like, parent decisions here. All right, guys. Here is our game. It's a simple game. It's going to be a fun game. The, the game is this. Allison, if I can have these whiteboards, thank you very much. The question I'm going to ask is, if your child went missing, where do you think they most likely would be? So parents, I am going to give you the whiteboard. I think we're, I'm going to give you that pen. I think we're missing pins here. There's one, there's one. Can I get two pins, Allison? Sorry, hold up. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Here's your pen. Here's your pen. So when you guys hear the music end, I'm going to ask your child where they will most likely be. Don't cheat, kids. You need to be able to try and match with your parents. And here's the thing. At Arbor Students, I have a tradition. When, when we play a contest, a big one, like our last one, we did, a, uh, we did pumpkin carving, and then we did uh, create your own ugly sweaters. What I'm going to do with these families is they get movie passes. So... Star Wars is on us. Jake highly recommends it, so you can watch Star Wars. So after you hear the amazing music, we'll go. Play the music. Yeah, I, I, I hope you did. I hope you did. I hope you nailed it. Don't, whoa, 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 whoa. You see this? Orchard Kids, Michael, come on. You're a middle schooler. You're not going to cheat, right? Oh, really? Okay. I hope that's the answer. All right. 
I saw, I saw, is this, is this turned on? I saw you whispering in his ear. It wasn't cheating, was it? No. Okay, all right, all right. So, tell me your name, tell the world your name. Parker. Parker, and what is your name? Melissa. Melissa and Parker. Parker, if you went missing, where do you think you most likely be? Where would your parents find you? Uh, at the park. At the park. If you wrote the park, you get movie passes. If not, Jake and I got a date with each other. <laughs> There's a third one too, so we'll probably invite Garrett. What did you write? I wrote Mason's house. Mason's house. Is that where you would be? No. No? <laughs> Hopefully Mason's not here. <laughs> what is your name? Tell the world. Catherine. Catherine and? Austin. Austin. All right. Catherine, if you went missing, where would your dad have to find you? Where would you most likely be? In my room reading. In her room reading. <laughs> Overachiever. The Bible, right? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Better than no. Better than no. I would say I'll accept the Maybe. What did you write? Still at school. School. <laughs> I mean, it's close. You might be reading at school. All right. Two movies for Jake and I. All right. Tell the world your name. Michael. And your name? Todd. Todd. All right, Michael. My man, Michael. I like Michael. I feel like he has the right answer. I feel like these two are in sync with each other. Do you guys feel that way? <laughs> Michael, don't let, don't let Arbor down here. Where would your parents find you? I'm going to go with my gut and say Monroe slash Luke's house. Monroe slash Luke's house. I looked at your dad's board and uh, pretty close. All right. The answer he wrote is? Sleeping in his room. Sleeping <laughs> in his room. <laughs> you don't think that would be? <laughs> your mom agrees. Guys, none of you matched your kids, but we're still going to give you guys movie passes. There you guys go. You guys can have a seat. Give them a bigger round of applause. They did a good job. I'll take them from you. Hopefully that doesn't mess Hayden up. But you see, our parents, when your kids go missing, you really have that tough decision to make. Where can they be? And now, that is the, the issue that Mary and Joseph are having. Where can Jesus be throughout all of this? So they're talking, and they're deciding, and they're thinking, and they're wondering, where can our kid be? So now they're wondering, could he still be at Jerusalem? Could we have left him behind at Jerusalem? Now here's the big problem with that. Mary and Joseph have already walked for one full day. They walked one full day before realizing that Jesus is gone. And again, it makes sense. There's thousands of people. They thought Jesus was just amongst the crowd. But it's been one whole day. So here's a tough choice you have to make. If, in fact, that Jesus got left in Jerusalem, it's going to take a whole nother day back. And that's going to be two whole days that they have been missing their son. But after thinking and deciding, they decide that they need to make that trip. They are going to make the trip back to Jerusalem, and they do. They make the one day going by. And now, you, have to, you, you as parents, you understand that Mary and Joseph, they're stressed out. They're going through different emotions, like just praying, like, oh, my gosh, I hope that he's not in a ditch somewhere, just somewhere. And then, and then Joseph, trying to be a great father, is probably saying, a great husband, like, Mary, it's okay, we will find him, we will find him, it's okay. You know, those words that make you feel good, but in the end, not really helping all that much. But it's okay, we'll find him. And so they make this, they're thinking, they're talking, and then they finally get to Jerusalem. So again, guys, this has been two whole days, two whole days that they can't find Jesus. So now they're in Jerusalem, and now this is a big city. They have to now find this needle in a haystack. So they're going by asking, have you seen my son? Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen my son? People are like, what does he look like? It's like Caucasian, blonde hair, blue eyes, probably holding a lamb. <laughs> but have you, have, you, have you seen my son? 
where's my son? So there they're, they're looking. It's a t- they're searching and searching. They're terrified. Again, going through every emotion possible. And then after three days, three long, terrifying, excruciating days, they find Jesus. And who knows where he's been sleeping, who knows where he's been eating, but they found Jesus. And they found him in the place that he would most likely be anyways, and that is the temple. And all I got to say is, none of the kids up here said Arbor. So (laughs) I'll take responsibility for Catherine and Michael. I got some work to do on Thursday nights. (laughs) Sorry, man. (laughs) But they find Jesus. He is safe and he's amongst the teachers. And I, and I love this. It says that as, as they see Jesus, he's listening to the teachers. And he's ans- asking questions. And he's answering questions. And it says that the people around were amazed by his understanding. Now I want to nerd out a little bit here because I love that sentence. I love that verse where it says that they were amazed by his understanding. See, looking that up in the original language, what that word amazed means is that he literally stood out. He stood out, this 12-year-old boy, as he's around teachers and and people and the crowd just listening. It says that this 12-year-old boy stood out amongst everybody else. They were amazed at his understanding. And it says that his parents were astonished astonished when they found him. They were amazed and they were astonished. But there is the matter at hand. Jesus did not join his family in their journey and stayed behind. So Mary and Joseph addressed this. Mary looks at Jesus and he says, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And Jesus responded, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Some translations say, be about my father's business. Like, and, and so they're talking, and the parents have that, do you know what you have put us through conversation? That's what, that's what that conversation was about. And Jesus, he's confused He's confused and he's trying to explain himself because he seriously, like, he thinks they should know what he was doing because he was born to do that. That That's the whole reason for his existence, to be doing what he's doing. He's 12 years old. He's a man. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. So, So he is confused and he's explaining why he thinks that he is right. You know I would be in my father's house. You know I would be about my father's business. And this is what it says. After Jesus says that, you know I'd I'd be in my father's house. You know I'd be about my my father's business. It states that they couldn't understand him. They couldn't understand what he was saying right there. They couldn't understand. So kids, if you think your parents just don't understand you, Jesus understands. He experienced it. He knows what it's like to be around confusing parents or maybe parents who really just don't get it. But here's the amazing part. Even though Jesus think he was right, knows that they should know that what he was doing was right, this is what it says in verse 51. It says, Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in, it, in, in her heart. She so states that Jesus was obedient to them, even though he might have felt like he was right. And parents... It states that his mother treasured all these things in her heart, even though she was probably steamed, probably incredibly angry. She still treasured this, a moment like this, being scared, being anxious for three whole days. She treasured these moments in her heart. So our point for this morning, guys, for you 18 years or older to order, or those of you begging those who are to order, here's our point. Kids, if you can listen to me, kids. Look me in the eye. I'm sorry I have to say this, but here's the truth. Even though you are right, you still have to act right. You still have to act right. But don't worry, your parents aren't off the hook because parents, even though you are wronged, 
it doesn't mean that you can act wrong. So kids, I want to bring up that, uh, that Ephesians verse back up. Ephesians verse says that you should obey your parents because you are the Lord's and it's the right thing for you to do. But when you're right, you have to act right. Obey your parents not just because your life will be extended on this earth, not because your parents have brought you into this world and, and they can take you out of this world, but you should act right because it is the right thing to do and because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ did it when he was 12 years old. He obeyed his parents, even though he felt like he was doing the thing that he was called to do on this earth. So even when you're right, you still have to act right. But parents, even though you're wronged, it does not mean you can act wrong. Ephesians, if we bring that verse back up for you guys, it says, do not provoke your children to the point of anger by the way you treat them. And look at Mary and Joseph in the story. They're going through every emotion imaginable as they're trying to find Jesus. They're worried, they're stressed, they're on this three-day journey, and they're probably like just praying to God and wondering where the heck that angel is that told them 12 years ago that they're even raising this kid. Like, how, where is he to tell us where Jesus is? And they're like, they're like just worried. Again, he could be in a ditch somewhere. Where is our son? Can you help us find Jesus? Lord, where is your son? Also, we're very sorry that we lost him. We'll find him, don't worry. But if you can help us, it'll be great. But where is Jesus? And that moment that they found Jesus, you know that Mary was just all those emotions. She went through what I call a, a relief and a release. A relief that she found Jesus, there's her son, but then a, a release of all those emotions that were just balled up. So you know that she was crying from just being so excited that she found her son, but also sorrowful at the same time and the anger that has bottled up. And she could have literally said anything in the, in the world because this anger that just now is there. But she says, son, why have you treated us like this? Don't you know that your father and I have been anxiously searching for you? I don't know about you guys, but that would not be my first response <laughs> in this moment. You see, me and my brothers growing up, we, we, we lived on a ranch, and we had a lot of trees, and we liked to climb things and jump off things. Me and my brother one time jumped off a bush because we thought uh, somebody would take our picture and be in the newspaper. We were disappointed the next day. That didn't happen. But my brother one time decided to climb this huge, huge tree that was in our front yard. I mean, it's, it's a huge base, kind of looked like a gigantic Christmas tree. But the problem with trees like that is as it's like thick and sturdy in the base, as you get to the top, it gets very very, very fragile. So my brother, at this time, he is probably a freshman in high school. He is climbing this tree. He's like, yes, I'm doing this. I've been waiting for this moment, climbing this tree. And he gets really high, guys. Just to let you know how big this tree is, um, this is probably my, our house was like a one-story house. This is probably three of our houses, like climbing up to this tree. And we're just looking. And maybe I'm like, you know, I was a kid, so maybe the tree's not that big if I go there now. But He's up on this tree, I'm looking at it, and then out of nowhere, you just start hearing branches snap. And my brother went boom, 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 hold on, fell, boom, boom, boom. And just as he finally like, hit the last of the branches, just hit the ground. And you know my brother's having that <gasps> moment because he can't breathe. Next thing you know, my dad comes <laughs> flying out and you would think his reaction would be, oh, are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, that wasn't, a, that wasn't smart, was it? No, it wasn't. What did we learn today? Yeah. <laughs> when you start breathing, we'll talk about it. <laughs> no, that wasn't his reaction. My dad was very, very mad seeing my brother do something that was really, really dumb. I think my brother got grounded till today. He's finally released. <laughs> But my dad was angry, and that is how we react as parents. We just get so flustered. All these emotions come out, and we just get so angry. But the verse says, don't provoke our children to the point of anger for us and get them angry and get in that, that constant cycle of, I need a cell phone. No, you don't. I need a cell phone. No, you don't. I want to be a Snapchat. That Definitely no. I need a cell phone. Did, does this sound like anybody's Christmas this last Christmas? But we, we, parents, you will get wronged. 
But when you get wronged, it doesn't give you the permission to act wrong. This is, this is a team. This is a team effort with our family, guys. Team effort with our church family here, but a team effort within your family. Kids, even when you're right, and I'm going to be honest with you, you kids are smart. You're probably right in a lot of times. And parents, we just don't want, we, we don't want to let you know. But when you are right, you still have to act right. And parents, when you have been wronged, eh, you cannot act wrong. It does not give you the permission. So those are our points for the whole family. But maybe you're here. Maybe you're here and you're like, I, I haven't gotten started on this, this whole family thing yet. And, you know, those verses or those points I think can last, like, can help you throughout life. If you're right, you know, don't, don't act right. If, if you've been wronged, you know, don't, don't act wrong. That's, that's good. But literally in this, that's, that's not what it's saying for you. But for you, if you haven't got started on this whole family thing, I think what you can do is look at Jesus. How this kid who thinks he was right, the son of God, humbled himself to his parents, but humbled himself to his father. And let's be humbled by that. And let me be honest with you, there's never a bad time to be humbled by Jesus, if you ask me. But if that's you, let's just look at our amazing Savior who stood out from the point of being born to being 12 to the point on the cross to his resurrection and ascension. We can look at Jesus and just be amazed and be humbled by that. Right. Now, guys, I'm telling you, I had a lot of fun with this. I got to be more crazy on stage than I've ever been. Thank you so much. Thank you, Arbor family. I'm going to pray. The band can come back up, and we can enjoy the Niners winning. Dear Heavenly Father. Thanks for joining us online here at Arbor. If you enjoyed watching, please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on whatever social media platform you use. Maybe you're interested in joining a group, volunteering, or just want to get to know us more. Visit our website, arborchurch.com. I hope you have a great day and thanks for watching.